Welcome to class 9 on uh, topics in power electronics and distributed generation. Uh, in the last class, we had talked about uh, coordination between protective devices. We had looked at uh, coordination between a circuit breaker, and upstream and downstream circuit breaker, uh, upstream and downstream fuse, we briefly discussed about that. Then we looked at an example of a recloser with a downstream circuit breaker and we started the discussion on uh, uh, upstream fuse and a downstream recloser. So, if you look at uh, the case of uh, the upstream recloser with a, a downstream circuit breaker, we defined what uh, coordination implies and what we saw was that the lower ranges of current levels, we need to ensure that uh, C, uh, your circuit breaker operates before uh, the recloser locks out. So, for a fault in zone 2 or maybe further downstream, the fault current level may be small which means that C B 2 will ne need longer and longer time for it to operate and you want to ensure that even under that condition, you have coordination which means that R does not lock out before the operation of the downstream appropriate downstream device. Uh, so, that, that is one thing that we saw in the last class. So, today we will look at uh, the, the coordination of a, a upstream fuse, it could also be a circuit breaker with a recloser and last time we are uh, saying what uh, it needs, uh, what it means by coordination in this particular case and say for example, for a, a fault in zone 2, you want to ensure that uh, the recloser operates to clear temporary faults and it should not lock out uh, uh, say in a situation where the locker duration is longer than the uh, time for the fuse to melt. So, you do not want to uh, you do not want fuse F 1 melting for faults in zone 2. Okay. So, we will look at an example of uh, the coordination of uh, the, the fuse upstream fuse and the recloser and uh, for the analysis what we will do is we will use the data that we ha had for our uh, circuit breaker, circuit breaker uh, example and we will look at then what the device parameters are in this particular case. So, for the recloser, uh, we again look at a two cycle recloser, where uh, if a fault occurs at say uh, some duration of time, for a short duration T naught, you allow the full current to flow and then the recloser opens. So, your off duration in this particular example is 5 seconds and then you reclose, you reclose for a duration of uh, 0.7 seconds if the fault is uh, still present, then after 0.7 seconds it opens again, waits for another off duration. In this example, it is again 5 seconds, then it recloses a second time and it stays closed for 1 second and if the fault continues in this particular duration, after 1 second it locks open after it completes, in this case 2 reclose attempts it can be the reclosing attempts can be programmable to be more lesser etcetera. Uh, if so, if you look at your RMS current levels, this would be the uh, pattern of RMS current levels where you have a, a permanent fault downstream of the recloser. For the upstream fuse, we will assume that the fuse has a, a melt current of 225 amps. So, if you had a circuit breaker, you would be talking about a pickup current level here you are looking at at what current at what is the minimum current level at which the fuse would melt and we will take it as 225 amps. We will take the I square T as 1.8 into 10 to the power of 6 ampere square second and the corresponding uh, parameters we will uh, assume that the fuse needs at least uh, 2 cycles of 40 milliseconds to operate. It is extremely inverse characteristic. So, P is 2 and corresponding to the I square T you would get uh, and the I melt you would get a A of 35 and you have a reset time this is essentially the cool down, cool down time of the fuse 
of 60 seconds. So, it means that after it gets fully hot after a minute the fuse cools back to nominal temperature. So, if you look at this particular example then you can ask what would be the, the response of the fuse and the recloser for faults under different conditions. So, for a fault in zone 2, And if you look at the range of currents uh, in zone 2, your I f max is uh, 1000 amps. So, at I f max of uh, zone 2 of 1000 amps, you have your T melt for F 1 is given by 35. So, it would melt in about uh, 1.9 seconds and so if your first duration T naught corresponds to 0 0.1 seconds 100 milliseconds. So, that corresponds to 0 0.1 divided by 1.91 or 5.2 percent of T melt. Then if you look at T of 1 which is 5 seconds. So, that corresponds to 5 by 60 because 60 is now the reset time this corresponds to 8.3 percent of T reset. So, so, at this particular point at the end of T of 1, so at the end of T of 1 over here you can as assume that the fuse is uh, cooled back down to the ambient temperature. So, so then if you look at what happens in the next duration it uh, your first reclose cycle you have T C 1 uh, you have 0.7 seconds. So, 0.7 divided by 1.91 that corresponds to about 36.7 percent of T melt. And then if you look at the subsequent off duration your T of 2 which is again 5 seconds. So, this corresponds to again 8.3 percent of T reset. So, at this particular point 36 minus 8.3. Uh, so, the fuse F 1 is at 28.4 percent of melting. So, into, into the melting point it has reached about 28.4 percent of the way. So, so if you look at uh, your uh, T 
TC1, which is your se second reclose cycle, your TC1, which is 1 second, so which is uh, 1 by 1.91 or 63 percent of T melt. And if you take this 63 plus 28.4, that is 91 percent of your melting point. So, your recloser would actually lock out before the fuse melts because it would melt at the 100 percent point. So, it reached 91 percent of, uh, of uh, the melt time. So, the margin that you have between the 91 and the 100 percent is uh, is 100 minus 91. is 0 0.17 seconds. So, 170 milliseconds before the fuse would have melt, your recloser locks open. Okay. So, if you look at the system, uh, at this particular point, the fuse uh, did not melt. If you uh, have a fault in zone 2, uh, which was permanent, uh, 170 milliseconds before the fuse would have melted, your recloser locked open for a permanent fault in zone 2. Okay. So, that uh, achieves the objective of not damaging the fuse for a fault in zone 2. So, then we will look at what would happen when you have uh, this is at the highest high current end of the range, what would happen at the low current end of the range. So, in, in this what you did was uh, in zone 2, the, there were 2 reclose attempts and it tried to clear uh, a temporary fault twice and if that did not happen, then it uh, did what it should do which is lock out. Okay. So, if you look at then at the at I f min of zone 2, which is 600 amps, your T melt is 5.77 seconds. It so, at 600 amps, it would need a longer time for it to melt. So, if you look at then your calculations, your T01, your first duration of current pulse, uh, which is 0 0.1 seconds, would take the fuse to 1.7 percent of melting. If you look at T of 1, which is 5 seconds this corresponds to 8.3 percent of duration of its reset time. So, here again it is fully uh, reset you can, or fully cooled down. Then if you look at T C 1, which is uh, 0 0.7 seconds, this corresponds to 12.1 percent and T of 2, which is 5 seconds again, which is 8.3 percent. So, at this particular point, the fuse is, uh, fuse is 3.8 percent uh, of the melt point, the, the point, the time at which it would have melt. So, if you then look at T C 2, which is 1 second, this corresponds to 20.8 percent of your time to melt. So, if you look at uh, the point at which the recloser locks open, So, 
the uh, recloser locks open at 24 uh, nearly 25 percent of the fuse melting. So, your margin is uh, 4.4 seconds. So, you can see that at the lower current level your margin actually improved. So, uh, uh, that is not uh, a problem the, the what you need to pay closer attention is actually at the high current levels rather than at the low current levels. What you saw was for the uh, coordination with the downstream breaker of fuse you have to pay attention at the lower current with the upstream one you have to uh, pay particular attention at the higher current level. Okay. So, the margin is actually improving as your uh, current uh, level is reducing. So, if you look at uh, between uh, there is actually a further range between 600 and uh, uh, 225 amps say uh, if you take your uh, uh, just the plain recloser and say you are uh, having a threshold where it actuates somewhere close to 600 amps, then uh, uh, between 600 amps and 225 amps there is still a possibility of the upstream fuse uh, operating because the fuse melt current is 225 amps. So, Uh, load current, surge or fault current. So, uh, so, if you want to uh, then coordinate this uh, downstream recloser with a upstream fuse, you can do a couple of things. One is you could use a I threshold of your recloser uh, to be 225 amps. So, this would be with uh, trying to ensure that uh, the recloser would operate for any current level which can potentially damage the switch. Uh, the fuse, but uh, if you set your threshold levels for protection to be extremely low, then there is always a possibility that the recloser will be prone to uh, nuisance uh, falls. Every time a motor in the downstream starts up, etcetera, you might have nuisance trips in your recloser. So, you do not want to push your threshold level to be too low. So, what uh, you could actually do is uh, uh, make sure that at the lower current levels you uh, have not just the reclose logic, but also have embedded uh, uh, circuit breaker uh, characteristic which would actually uh, enable your, uh, your faults to be cleared uh, at in your downstream device at a faster uh, at a earlier instant of time compared to your upstream fuse. Okay. So, So, you can see that uh, uh, you have to pay attention to the entire range of uh, possible currents that flow in these protective devices to actually ensure that uh, it operates in a proper manner. In fact, uh, what you saw was that uh, the recloser can be used say along with a fuse, it can be either a upstream fuse or a downstream fuse uh, in such a manner that uh, uh, the fuse does not get damaged for temporary faults 
So, without a recloser if it was just a circuit breaker or with uh, long delays etcetera, it would just operate without uh, uh, the ability to uh, uh, say clear temporary faults. And most uh, large number of faults, the majority of faults are actually temporary faults. So, this uh, strategy of uh, using a recloser to actually uh, uh, prevent fuses from blowing is called a fuse saving strategy because every time a fuse blows you have to go in and replace it. So, it actually saves cost by making use of the appropriate protection settings to prevent uh, uh, a upstream or a downstream fuse from getting damaged by appropriately timing and doing a proper coordination of your protective elements. Okay. So, if you then look at uh, what could be the other elements where you could uh, say think of coordination, you could have uh, uh, coordination where you are looking at uh, maybe a, a sectionalizer with a recloser and we saw for a sectionalizer with a recloser what you would do is you would uh, uh, ensure the number of counts in your sectionalizer is one count lesser than your up, upstream uh, recloser. So, this sectionalizer is intended for use downstream of a uh, recloser. Uh, in case you have a sectionalizer with a fuse or a circuit breaker, what you do is you do the same calculations, but with now one fewer number of uh, current pulses or one fewer reclose counts and whatever calculations that you that we looked at with the recloser would work with the sectionalizer except that the number of cycles would be one fewer. Okay, so, so what we have done so far can be uh, applied in a, a broader uh, setting where irrespective of the, the, the possible combinations of protective device that is being used in the system. Okay. Now, if you look at uh, a circuit breaker characteristics that we have uh, just seen, it is having a single uh, I square t value or the equivalent uh, a b uh, parameters a b p parameters etcetera, but uh, many modern circuit breakers uh, it is actually uh, having digital trip units which means that you could actually have more uh, complex uh, protective uh, settings. So, you could have uh, settings that incorporate uh, multiple protection curves in a single circuit breaker. Okay. For example, what is shown over here is a circuit breaker with settings for long term, short term and instantaneous protection. So, uh, if you look at uh, the protection curves, you might have uh, 1 i square t. So, So, if you look at uh, uh, what is uh, plotted over here, it is current magnitude on your x, x, x axis and your tripping time in your y axis plotted on a log log basis. So, yeah, some multiplier times your rated uh, current would be your long current settings. So, you could have multipliers which might be uh, uh, rated of the order of say 1.5. for your uh, for your m uh, ml so uh, 1.52 etc similarly you would have uh, short term current levels where you are looking at multipliers like say 4 5 etc and you might have instantaneous trip levels where 10 times your rated current would cause instantaneous trips so you are talking about uh, uh, much higher current level for instantaneous trips and corresponding to your, your current level at which you have uh, long term protection versus your time at which you would act, you have i square t long, you would have uh, i square t short and your inst uh, instantaneous uh, uh, trip settings and you might have much 
uh, higher current uh, level that can potentially flow through the circuit that depends on what is the upstream impedance of your uh, your circuit. So, if your upstream impedance is uh, high which means that it is a weak grid then the source stiffness will ensure that the current maximum is um, lower. If the upstream is impedance is low which means the grid is very stiff then the fault current level is higher. Okay. So, you have limit of how much current the grid can also provide in terms of uh, being able to activate your uh, protective devices. So, if you look at then curves like this, this can be used beneficially in applications say for example, when you have uh, say possibly multiple downstream elements, you might have uh, uh, a circuit breaker, you might have a long section of wiring and then you might terminate it at a motor. So, you might have a I square T level for the motor, you might have a I square T level for your wiring. So, if you take a typical motor for starting you might have uh, a short duration where your current level goes fa fairly high. So, you want to ensure that even at current levels of say multipliers of 4 to 5 uh, its rated current your uh, trip does not happen. So, in a region such as uh, this you might want to operate for a short duration so that the motor can start without tripping a circuit breaker, but uh, quickly once the motor starts your current level will come back down to the node load level before you actually uh, switch in your mechanical load. So, you would have maybe a few seconds of uh, inrush current and then you can operate it uh, operate your, uh, your uh, protective device without tripping it, but then you have a protection curve which is sufficiently small. So, that if you have now uh, overloads on your equipment which will cause minutes of overcurrent, then if the overcurrent level is higher than some multiplier level uh, which might be as low as 1.5, then your breaker would open. So, you have different levels corresponding to your short term allowable current and uh, different level for your longer term allowable current. So, you could do you could have 1 I square T curve for wire damage you could have uh, an, another I square T uh, level for uh, load or or maybe a machine I square T capacity So, you can see that uh, the, the, protect, uh, the protection coordination with even a simple device such as a circuit breaker can become fairly complex uh, and uh, you have to think through what exactly is the logic required for actually uh, setting your protective device. So, if you look at uh, again the instantaneous trip levels in a circuit breaker, when you talk about instantaneous it is not instantaneous in the power electronic sense where when you talk about instantaneous uh, current levels in power converters you are talking about uh, the microseconds range, whereas here when you are talking about instantaneous you are talking about uh, say 1 to 5 cycles say 20 to 100 milliseconds. And, uh, with 20 milliseconds you cannot use a circuit breaker or a electromechanical protective device to protect a, a semiconductor device, because a semiconductor device uh, IGBT might get damaged in 10 microsecond, uh, diode or a SCR might get damaged in uh, half a cycle depending on what its peak non repetitive current capability is. So, you are talking about something which is less than a cycle for many uh, semiconductor device devices. So, you, these are not intended to protect uh, power semiconductor device, it is actually intended to protect uh, uh, say electrical equipment. Okay.
So, you can use it for wiring, machines, transformers, inductors, So, most of the balance of equipment which go into even a power electronic converter, you could think of protecting it using uh, uh, electromechanical or electrothermal device, but uh, not the semiconductor device. So, even if the semiconductor device gets damaged, that damaged semiconductor device might be followed up with some wiring getting burnt or some inductor getting burnt. So, your protective breaker in that particular case is actually uh, trying to prevent further damage from happening within your cabinet rather than actually trying to save your uh, circuit breaker uh, or trying to save your semiconductor device. So, if you look at uh, the instantaneous strips, your M i is you are talking about uh, things that are fairly large grade 10, 20 etcetera. Uh, and your trip times you are talking about one to five cycles. So, one is extremely fast you are talking about 20 to 100 millisecond and what can be achieved with say a 20 millisecond trip it uh, helps achieve a couple of things. One is say when you have a fault, uh, your fault current can often be to ground which means that there is current flowing into ground. So, when there is large amount of current flowing into ground, the ground potential or the cabinet potential itself can get elevated because of the impedances further downstream in the ground. So, if someone is touching a cabinet and simultaneously a fault is happening, your instantaneous strip will ensure that the high voltage is being seen by the individual for a very short duration okay, for 100 milliseconds or less and not for much longer duration. Okay. The second thing that happens when you have a fault is uh, if you are having fault currents with uh, very high uh, current level, fault current level, then you can potentially have arcing within your equipment. So, you uh, limit the amount of energy that goes into the arc by keeping your duration of your instantaneous uh, operation to be very small. So, if you have a fault and someone is standing nearby the amount of uh, thermal energy transferred to the individual depends on the amount of energy in the arc uh, which corresponds to the temperature of the arc. So, you want to ensure that uh, large arcs do not do not happen and it does not spread out into a wider area. So, as to protect uh, people who might be happen happening to be near equipment. Okay. So, So, the amount of energy in vaporized metal etcetera is proportional to how much energy has gone in. So, this would help in uh, aspects such as that. So, so after the instantaneous the next uh, 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 possibility is what you could do with uh, short term protection. So, when you are talking about short term protection, you are now talking about multipliers say in 3 to 10 uh, range and you are talking about now uh, trip times of uh, of uh, 5 to 50 cycles 
So, you are talking about say 100 milliseconds to 1 second or maybe a, a few seconds. So, in the range of a few seconds what can happen and uh, essentially what you are trying to ensure in with short term protection is that uh, equipment would have inrush during startup and you do not want the startup current level to actually occur on a longer term duration, but you do not want the starting to be interrupted because every time you are trying to restart equipment you are dumping more energy into that particular component. So, you would like it to successfully start up and you make use of the short term protection levels to ensure that you can take the inrush current for adequate duration before you uh, uh, have a shutdown or protective shutdown. So, So, you want to ensure that the windings in machines etcetera do not get damaged. So, you want to ensure that the startup current does not uh, happen for a over a longer time duration. Okay. Then if you are looking at your long protection, you are having multipliers. Uh, of course, you have to continuously carry the rated current. So, ML, the, so you are talking of something between 1 and 3 times the rated current. So, your trip times are now are now in the duration which is much longer uh, seconds to minutes because it is essentially how much time would it take for wiring to heat up the thermal time constants of some of these systems may be longer. So, when you are taking a higher overload it may take minutes for some uh, parts of uh, some of your protective uh, downstream equipment to actually heat up. So, essentially you are trying to ensure that uh, long duration of uh, over current or overload does not uh, lead to damage and this is essentially what you are trying to do with long protection. Okay. In fact, uh, a major uh, uh, reason for fires in many buildings people attribute it to uh, electrical failure. So, what it means is that some wiring at cer certain point got overheated beyond its level. So, wiring protection is actually quite important to make sure that uh, you can actually cause fairly serious damage by not uh, looking at wiring protection in a close manner. Uh, so, now that we have actually looked at the uh, protection in a fairly broad manner, uh, what we will do next is look at uh, now if you have a distribution system, what would happen if uh, you add a distributed generation source to the particular uh, feeder and then what would be its impact in terms of protection. So, we will look at an example where say you had you have a substation and you have a transformer with a given impedance. We will look at it in terms of an example and 
downstream from there you have uh, say bus 1 and you have a number of feeders. Uh, circuit breaker 1 is uh, protecting say feeder 1 and you have uh, impedance of 3 percent upstream uh, between bus 1 and 2. At bus 2 you have a lateral which is now protected say with circuit breaker 2 uh, which has uh, again an impedance uh, of 3 percent to another bus 4 and from bus 2 you have again the continuation of the feeder to bus 3 and at bus 2 you are thinking about adding a distributed generation source. So, suppose you did not have this particular source you would have some level of fault current levels in this particular feeder. So, the question is now that you are planning on adding say this particular DG unit what would happen to fault current levels uh, what would it be before and what would be what would it be after to add this particular uh, source into the system. So, what we will do is we will look at uh, possibility of faults at different locations on this uh, particular uh, simple example and look at uh, its impact in terms of protection. Okay. So, the first fault that we would consider is say a fault just downstream of uh, circuit breaker 1 and uh, if you look at that particular situation. at F 1, if you look at I F old, this is given by your voltage is 1 per unit and we will assume that in the example someone has done all the homework and given you all the parameters on a per unit basis uh, normalized for the entire system and so the upstream impedance in this particular case is the uh, impedance uh, seen from the substation transformer plus the upstream source. So, that is J uh, point uh, one four. So, this this leads to a fault current level of about 71.4 per unit. Now, if you look at your uh, 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 now the situation where you have now added the DG, if you look at your fault current level. Is uh, now you have two sources. One is the DG. One is your uh, your traditional your uh, your substation. So, if you look at the, the example system now when with the DG you have some amount of current coming in from the substation side and some amount of current coming in from the DG side which sees the impedance of 10 percent from the DG and 3 percent from your feeder. So, your total current uh, fault current has now increased to 79 per unit, but out of the 79 per unit you will have to look at what does the circuit breaker CB1 itself sees. So, you will have to take that 79 per unit and actually see look at what is the contribution from the source side, what is the contribution from the DG side. So, if you do that calculation you will see that uh, your new fault current level by C B 1 is actually still 71.4 per unit. So, even though the actual fall at the point of fall the current level increase the circuit breaker sees the same current as what it saw previously and the contribution of the DG is uh, 7.7 per unit and if you look at uh, so there is no change in the 
fault current level seen by C B 1 in this particular case, which means that the timings when it would trip is not going to change for this particular uh, case. So, if you know, then look at a second uh, situation where you have a fault current at say location F 3 and by location F 3 uh, it is uh, so you have a fault at uh, the location downs at uh, bus 3. Then if you look at what your I f old and I f new is, is 13.5 per unit and if you look at uh, I f nu j 0.014 plus j 0.03 and that impedance appears in parallel with your d g impedance which is 10 percent j 0.1 plus j 0.3 3 which, which is your uh, downstream impedance. So, your current seen by the fault is now higher which is 16.5 per unit. Now, if you look at what is the current seen by C B 1 circuit breaker 1 in this particular case. is uh, so it is a, a division of current between two parallel conductors. So, you can see that your fault current level seen by C B 1 is now 11.5 per unit. So, your circuit breaker 1 is actually now seeing a lower current in case of a fault at the end of the bus, which means that it will trip at a slower rate, which means it will take a longer duration to trip. So, uh, there is a possibility in that earlier you had a, a idea that it would trip at with a certain time. Now, because you have added a DG, now it will trip with a even longer duration of time. And in this case, you can again con look at the contribution of your DG. This five per unit, and this five plus eleven point five. That's that gives you the sixteen point five. So you wonder the actual fault current at the point of fault has increased, the fault current seen by the protective device has actually reduced. So, if you then look at a, a third location where you now have a fault at say location F 2. So, a F 2 location uh, I mean over here at uh, bus 4.
So, if you do a calculation of fault current at F 2 uh, in the old situation and in the new situation what you would see is the following. Okay. So, in the previous situation you had a fault current level a old situation of 13.5 per unit. Now, with the addition of the DG it is gone up to 16.5 per unit. So, if you then look at the current level that uh, CB2 needs to interrupt uh, for clearing a fault at F2. Now, CB2 needs to interrupt a higher level of fault current. Okay. So, you, you have the uh, a possibility that okay, CB2 is capable of clearing that higher fault current level, but you also have the possibility that if the rated interrupt current level of that particular breaker was 15, then by adding this particular DG unit over here, you potentially needed to upgrade that circuit breaker to handle the higher fault current level. Okay. implies it would trip faster So, if you had an existing circuit breaker in the system and now you added a DG, then you potentially need to uh, increase the rating of that particular breaker. Uh, the same situation is true for say a fault at uh, F 4. If you have a fault over here F 4, then you will uh, find that the fault current uh, rating of C B 4 uh, can potentially be higher than what it was previously. And what can complicate this particular situation is that the owner of this CB or this DG might be one individual, whereas the person who is owning the other CBs that are in parallel with the system might be a third person. So, it becomes a complicated question of uh, who is responsible for what. Okay. So, we will look at uh, discussion of uh, the implications of uh, these uh, issues on terms of uh, how to add a distributed generation unit. We'll have a discussion about this. Uh, we have done actually uh, a bit of analysis uh, of uh, how to do protection and coordination in uh, the distribution systems and uh, uh, textbooks would actually provide quite a bit of background on this uh, uh, material. Uh, you, you can act there are act uh, lots of good material out there. Uh, you can actually look at uh, data sheets from manufacturers. You look at can get for example, manufacturers of circuit breakers like ABB, Cooper Power, SNC Electric, Schneider Electric. There are also technical notes that uh, companies provide like uh, this Cahier Techniques. Uh, these are actually Cahier is I think French for report. So, they have a, I think about 100 reports on uh, technical publications related to protection and distribution systems etcetera. Uh, also, a uh, uh, good reference material is this IEEE standard 142 2007 recommended practices for grounding of uh, commercial and industrial power systems. Uh, this particular standard is sometimes referred to as the, the green book. It is a commonly referred book when you want to look at details of uh, grounding and protection etcetera. Uh, so, uh, this would be actually good background material to actually look at in addition to what you might have in a textbook on power systems analysis. Okay. So, we will continue with this discussion on uh, implications of adding the DG in the, in the next class and then we will look specifically at uh, 
some of the issues with grounding. Thank you.